Let's do some quick introductions. I'm Dave Salter with ProShip. I'm in charge of business development here. And we're in charge, we're here with Jack and James from Pregis who are going to be talking about automation, not just what they do, but good overview of the market and how things are going out there and some of the new things that are going on. And uh, really the whole idea is to talk about everything that's driving the automation, the innovation and everything coming with it. So why don't we just get started here and um, we will get going. Introduce James and Jack. Jack, why don't you quick tell us a little bit about yourself? Yes, so um, I'm the Director of Integration Services at, at Pregis. So really, uh, Pregis is a um, provider of protected packaging solutions. So we make all kinds of material, uh, basically anything outside of the box itself, all of the, you know, the bubble wrap or the inflatable cushioning paper. Uh, that would go into a box or the the bagging solutions that we'll take a look at today and uh, my my role at Pregis is looking at automating those solutions for customers um, and identifying partners that can help us uh, you know, provide turnkey automated solutions and james yep uh, james gorman i'm head of application engineering at the sharp bagging division of Pregis, so i specialize in the bagging machines and um you know, I work with the engineering department. I also work with uh, customers who have applications they want to discuss. Um, E-commerce is, is obviously very common what we're talking about today, but also just any any type of bagging application from automation or bulk feeding applications, uh, anything with robotics. So, in a, in a first for us that uh, pros who know, James is actually going to show us one of the pieces of equipment, a bagger, and show us how simple it is to use a machine and. Um, we'll talk about it during our discussion today, and James, you'll come back at the end to do that. So look forward to talking a little bit. Okay. Quick uh, housekeeping. If you've got any questions, uh, this is a, uh, a type the question out type of application for a webinar. So feel free to ask any questions that you want. We'll get to them when we get a chance, uh, but we do want to make sure that all the questions get answered. And there's, uh, I think there's some, topics that we're going to cover that we're going to leave a little more open-ended for you to ask questions about. But with that being said, why don't we move on here? Here's just a quick overview about what we're going to cover today. Basically, it's going to go right around the industry uh, trends that are out there, talk a little about automation, best practices, the integrations that we've got going there, and really the future of what's going on. And going from there, I think it'll offer a good opportunity to hear more about automation. Like I said, not just from Pregis, but from everyone that's out there doing it. Well, here's the big trend that we're seeing right now. Jack, why don't you walk us through, you've got our three big things we're talking about with automation and what they're affecting. Why don't you take us from here and what you think are the keys? Yeah, so, uh, you know, obviously a lot of drivers on this uh, page here, but I just want to focus on a couple. Uh, so earlier this year, we hit uh, all-time low in terms of vacancy rate for warehouses, which means companies need to do more with less. Uh, expanding into new facilities isn't necessarily an option just because they may not be available. So uh, what that means is, you know, you need to implement uh, processes or automation that allows you to be more efficient or maybe start thinking about expanding vertically instead of, you know, spreading out, which is maybe what we've traditionally done. Um, in that same sense, from a labor standpoint, uh, it's, in, you'll you'll hear time time and time again from anyone that's in an operations management position that labor is their biggest challenge by far. So getting people in and then also retaining them to to stay and, and work for longer than short periods of time. Uh, and then also you're competing with your neighbors. Uh, you know that same labor pool is is uh, you know your your neighbor might be going after. Uh, labor with uh, a $2,000 sign-on bonus or you know, a number of other incentives. So trying to keep that labor is, is incredibly difficult. And then on the automation side of things, so I think the biggest thing here is about nine out of 10 of uh, leaders within warehouse automation are looking at implementing a uh, more robust or more technology, technologically advanced WMS to make themselves more efficient over the next two years. So that tells you if nine out of 10 of uh, leaders in the space are going down that path that um, automation is going to be critical here for their success over the next two, three, five years. And we're going to talk about this a little bit more. We're going to talk about the warehouse management system, the WMS, and how important it is to driving your product, driving our software, how many things run through it. So that's it's a great point saying that people are looking at that and going from there. Um, 
you know, here's the trends again. We're looking at this, and, and you and I both said the same thing when we looked at this chart. Sustainability was number one three years ago. Now it's down to number four. It's still important. We'll talk about it, but it's amazing how other things during COVID moved up to the top in going from yeah, the, what? Anecdotally, uh, yeah. anecdotally as a as a provider of packaging material, I would say sustainability is a bigger topic now than it was in 2019. It's just some of these other uh, topics have leapfrogged it. Obviously, COVID exposed our, our supply chain to a degree in just-in-time inventory. So, you know, looking at um, a, a recent study from ABB, I think there were 70% of companies are looking at reshoring or nearshoring their operations. And that might not necessarily translate directly to e-commerce, but if you're bringing back those operations here, you're also now competing with that same labor pool. So again, labor comes in into that uh, equation as well. And a couple of these other things, you know, e-commerce pulled forward through COVID. Um, this year, it's going to hit the $1 trillion mark um, out of a total of $7 trillion in retail sales. So, you know, that's continuing to grow. I think there's a tiny lag right now, but still year over year, we're looking nine plus percent growth and double digits uh, through 2026. So. You know, this is still a, a hugely explosive market. Um, and, you know, the ways that we're going to solve that right here are going to be through automation and some of the things that uh, we look at. Uh, and, and specifically, you know, uh, on that last slide, there was a, a, a notation around robotics growth and how over the next five years that's going to expand by about tenfold. So, um, definitely going to start seeing that more and more in our warehouses uh, over the next few years. That's a great point. In fact, that's the main topic we're going to cover here in just a minute. So let's move on to the next one. Simple integrations. It, simple never seems that simple, does it, some of these times. But there's a lot of things you can do with it. Let's jump right into it. Optimizing workflow. It, and of course, you've got your great photo here of things going eight different directions. Why don't you walk me through some of the topics that are really key to making this and simplifying it? Yeah, so I mean, you can add robots to a, a warehouse, but if you don't have the right processes in place, the right workflows in place, WMS, routing uh, orders the right way, you're still not going to be as efficient as you can be. Um, so going through and starting to identify some of those challenges or problem areas um, is kind of step one. So what's your inbound uh, solution? How are you getting product uh, into inventory? And then how are you picking those products? So, you know, on a kind of lo-fi uh, look at things, you could have people manually picking. They might be doing some pick to light with a mobile cart. You could be on the more advanced side, something more like a, an auto store type of picking that's going on conveyance or potentially looking at autonomous mobile robots. So what, what's your, what's your uh, solution to get products out of inventory and to the pack station? And then kind of looking at the WMS too, what, what can your WMS do or help you do from a routing standpoint? So we're focused on the end of line packaging automation, but there's things up the line that impact that. So things like uh, the WMS being able to determine what products are in an order and what kind of protective requirements they need can help sort and route those products to specific pack stations. So if you have you know a wide product mix that has some uh, fragile items that require, you know, going in a box with some protective cushioning versus soft goods that might just uh, be set to go in a, in a bag. Uh, if you can route those beforehand, you'll make your, uh, your, your facility a lot more efficient and you'll save a lot of money in terms of, you know, dim weight reductions and things like that by making sure you're using the right type of packaging solution for that specific order. Um, and then some of the other things to think about. So getting the product to the pack station, how we're optimizing the, the actual uh, pack out itself, and then where is it going once it leaves there? So from a sortation standpoint, do you have conveyance going back on a trunk line that's going to scan and divert product to USPS and UPS and FedEx, or is it all going to a Gaylord? So all those kinds of different areas of the pack station, the, the fulfillment center, have uh, their own needs and requirements. And if you can outline that optimal workflow ahead of time and pre-program some of those things in your WMS, you're, uh, you're setting yourself up for success. Yeah, and I think it's um, it's almost like a, you know, that crawl, walk, run type thing. Where are you gonna do it? And starting at the WMS seems like it's key. 
and then working from there. Why don't we jump back into uh, this, what we're talking about also for a little automation, some things along the way, you just mentioned some of the things with it, but micro fulfillment, that's a big area that we're talking about right now with a trendy thing going on. Can you mind talk a little bit more about this? Yeah, so uh, a lot of companies um, are moving to a either a um, hybrid type of rollout where they have DCs, and then they're also using their retail brick and mortar stores to become micro fulfillment centers. I think Best Buy is a good example of this. They are uh, taking a number of their stores. They're uh, taking a, a good portion of that square footage that was traditionally uh, space for their their um, their retail customers, and now they're turning into like a mini warehouse in the, on their back end, so that they're able to fulfill orders same day or next day to their customers. Um, so a lot of times, you know, that's that's again doing more with less. You know, you don't have the same square footage, you don't have the ability to put in a lot of these conveyance lines that you would have in a traditional distribution center. So uh, being able to optimize your picking, having the the right uh, product mix, like what we see here is uh, a pack station. And you know, it's not the most impressive when we're talking about automation and some of the other things we're gonna look at, but um, you, know, you can see there's a paper system on there. Uh, the things that that allows you to do is basically minimize the, uh, the packaging um, storage space in your, in your warehouse or in your micro fulfillment center. So, you, instead of having um, bundles and bundles of uh, bubble wrap, you can instead have uh, compact rolls of film or compact rolls of paper that run through a system and inflate on demand. So um, you're really able to optimize that, that space and, and save it for more uh, valuable, you know, whether that's your, um, your inventory or, or whatever is a better use of that space. You don't need to have uh, packaging taking up that valuable um, that valuable space in your center. And then another thing that I want to talk about here too is you know being able to make life easier for your packers is a, a big part of retaining talent and, and keeping people in your center. So if you're able to minimize their movement, if you're able to always have what they need at a pack station so they're not wandering around looking for um, tape or uh, another roll of bubble like I was saying before, you're keeping them there, you're keeping the, that line moving, it's efficient. And then also, you're, if you're looking at ergonomics and, and how that impacts the worker, just making sure that they're minimizing their actual motion so it's, you know, you're not doing a lot of repetitive types of uh, tearing and things that may cause, um, cause, you know, some concerns from a safety standpoint to that worker. So it's, it's protecting your worker, it's making it easy for them, it's making sure they always have what they need. And, sometimes some light anime, uh, automation like that can go a long way. It's amazing how you bring up the micro fulfillment too, of what we're talking about. The growth of ship from store that you mentioned has been a great deal of growth for ProShip for multi-carrier shipping software. They may not just be as elaborate an option for some of our customers to ship, but they have uh, restrictions on what trucks may come in, some of the things going out. So the idea of doing a very good pack station that's good for a store, has it centralized, makes it easier for it to do it. Limit the number of choices of what they have to put in boxes or the boxes to use, but simplifying the packing material is key to this and going from there. And it's just as you mentioned, keeping it simple is the best route from it and not taking up too much space with packing materials, everything else. Um, why don't we move on from there? I know we talked about um, some of the things we were gonna talk about were like the general rule of thumb when you compare manual stations compared to automation. Can you run through that formula for us? Yeah, so uh, what you're seeing here is uh, a tabletop bagging machine. Um, and generally what we say is when you implement a bag, an automated bagger like that into your fulfillment center, uh, that has the same throughput as four uh, packers manually uh, closing bags and sealing them. So right off the bat, you're able to redeploy three packers to other areas of that warehouse. Um, you're also able to take a lot of the, uh, the decision-making off of that packer's plate. So instead of having to decide between numbers of different size boxes or bags, you're, you're auto-implementing a singular solution. And you're also able to eliminate some other, um, some additional um, layers to the packing process, uh, like in this case, labels are printed directly on that bag so you you're taking that off the packer's plate all they really need to do is scan an item 
drop it in the bagger and seal that product. Um, so typically what we see in this kind of solution, and James will do a, a demo a little later here, is um, you'll see an ROI depending on your throughput and labor costs, generally in around six to nine months when you're uh, investing in bagging automation. So, it, you know, you always see this diagram out there. Four employees can equal the one when you bring in some automation. Where do you see these people going typically? What's the, how do you do the ROI sell for that? Yeah, I mean, really, when you're looking at uh, just labor challenges in general, um, it's really, they could go anywhere in that, that fulfillment center, uh, places that might require a more um, hand uh, or a more human touch. And maybe that's um, doing some validations. It might be uh, going into doing returns. Returns is something that uh, every company struggles with. There's not really a good way to automate that. It usually requires uh, human intervention. So if you can take people off of that hand packing and put them into those kinds of roles, then you're, you know, you're saving yourself a lot of time and money. Yeah, and it, as I move down to the next slide here, it seems like automation, especially in the e-commerce world, is really coming into play. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so this is a good example of a company that optimized their, uh, their picking and sortation. So they were able to uh, take product and route it to specific pack stations. Here you're seeing uh, soft goods and um, durable goods that are going through a bagger. The challenge here though was, although that was all optimized, their WMS had a, a high latency period between the order getting scanned and uh, finding the right uh, shipping information to send that back down to the pack station to be uh, printed on each of those bags. So there was a bottleneck in the fulfillment center. Everything was getting quickly to the pack out stations, but then the packer was only able to get between two and four out a minute. Uh, so our engineering team, the team that James works on, came up with a, a solution, a workaround, where we were able to uh, combat that latency by, instead of printing the label on the bag on the front end of the application, do a print and apply solution on the back side. So as that packer scanned an order, uh, they were immediately placing the product in the bagger, sealing it. And then in the meantime, the WMS was tracking down that shipping information, sending it back down to the pack station, and there's a print and apply on that uh, exit conveyance. So we were able to move that kind of that latency period down the line and accommodate for it and increase the throughput to around 16 uh, packages a minute. So um, quick, you know, when you're looking at the going from, you know, two to four to 16 a minute, that that throughput is meeting the uh, the needs of up the line going to the picking, you're able to eliminate a lot of other pack stations or manual pack stations. And this customer saw uh, the ROI in, in nine months, and implemented that across a number of different facilities and saved uh, around $6 million on their first year of implementing this solution into their facilities. And especially with peak periods, automation seems to really play a big role in being able to handle this. Um, and we'll cover this in, a, in another slide you're coming up. But what, how, is, how are the companies reacting to this when it gets to peak? How are they seeing this solution really help them? Yeah, so peak season, um, a, a lot of times uh, our customers will have, um, you know, they'll have a number of different uh, pack stations that have different bag sizes. So each, each automated bagger might have a specific size, which is great because it can um, it, it make sure that you're using the right size. It'll minimize the shipping costs. Uh, in peak season, we see the flow is just hard to overcome. So a lot of times those customers will uh, kind of default to a larger bag setting uh, so that they can they're not doing that that routing. They're just making sure that those those bags are going as quickly as possible through the through the system. Um, they also will flex uh, additional resources during peak season. Uh, we'll see some of those later, that which is like an AMR solution where you can get additional units into your facility to combat peak, and then you could you could scale that back down to your baseline levels once you get through that you know that busy season, which typically e-commerce we know is. September, October, November, December. Sounds great. Here we go, best demonstrated practices. Um, run me through some of these key ones in here. Where's the buy-in gotta come from? Yeah, so 
Typically, you know, that might go into your operations procurement team, but I think uh, starting with all of your stakeholders is critical here. And I say that because we, we've had a lot of um, customers that have implemented solutions and then uh, down the line, a marketing team or a, a brand manager has gotten involved and then dictated that specific products needed to go in specific types of packaging, which might change your layout, it might change your routing needs in terms of your WMS. So making sure that you're you're getting all of your stakeholders involved early, really documenting what each, each of those um, departments biggest challenges are and objectives are, and then also making sure that you're understanding where your, your baseline is today. So what's your throughput? What's your uh, average labor cost? Do you know your material costs? Do you know your average shipping rate? And then you can use those baselines to you know, determine uh, either buy-in if you're gonna invest in automation or at least look at the, the ROI and look at how you've improved year over year once you implement some of those solutions. You know, you talk about the big challenges. I think we covered those um, with what's going out there. Um, you know, it's really easy to talk about space materials, everything else. When you start talking about KPIs to really track your ROI, can you cover that a little bit? Because I think that's key to, to justify your expenses in the end. Yeah, so um, if you don't know what your average labor cost is, if you don't know uh, what your cost per package is out the door, it's gonna be hard to really uh, validate some of the decisions you made. So, um, and, and you gotta look beyond just uh, just the, the hourly cost too. You gotta look at the recruitment costs, the, the training costs, some of those things that are a little bit more hidden than um, you know, what you're just spending in terms of, of salary. Um, another thing that, you know, when we're looking holistically too, it's um, do you know what your damage rates are? Do you know what your return rates, things like that, because uh, oftentimes if you don't have the right solutions in place and your, your damage rates uh, 10% plus, uh, all of those costs need to be uh, considered and you got to look at the uh, customer lifetime value as well. So a lot of times in the e-commerce space, uh, if a deliver a damaged product to a, a consumer, they're gonna return it and they're likely not gonna order from that, uh, that company again. So there's a lot of hidden costs in there that don't necessarily uh, show up and you kind of have to do a little bit of digging and bring in those, those different stakeholders to uh, make sure that you're documenting all of those different pieces of the puzzle and you're, you're accounting for that when you're looking at your, your holistic solution. And again, the one thing we talk about, scalability. Um, just walk me through a couple of things because it seems like everybody's going for that quick hit. They want to see it. But what do you see with automation and adding more products perhaps? Yeah, I think it's important to not try to go from zero to 60. Uh, just make incremental incremental improvements. Make sure that you're investing in solutions that are modular. So when you get to a point where you can um, go full automation, your those uh, solutions that are already in your uh, fulfillment center can be augmented to, to account for that. So, you know, like I was last week, I was in a fulfillment center that was very, you know, if you're looking at one to 10 on the automation scale, it's it's a one. They have, uh, they have a number of um, racks and then they have uh, pickers that are getting uh, order slips and then they're going and finding each of those products for each order, putting it in a tote and bringing it back. So. To try to go from there to investing in a solution like an, an auto store and have uh, or you know have variety of robotics in that in that uh, fulfillment center just seems like it, there's there's a lot that can be uh, improved without doing a, a full investment in automation that they may, might not need right now. So things like a, a WMS with maybe pick to light or um, having some some kind of um, uh, pick implementation that can increase the efficiency there would go a lot further than implementing a full robotic solution. Just make sure that you're kind of setting yourself up so as your company grows, your, your solutions are able to grow with you, I would say is, is a big thing here. So, and last part of this, we are getting asked this all the time within ProShip and our clients. What investment method do you see? We're seeing a big push now to subscription or SaaS-based models. Uh, getting away from CapEx. What are you seeing uh, for a lot of the customers that are out there right now? Yeah, I think I'm seeing a lot of um, 
as a service, a lot of robotics as a service or packaging as a service. Um, and uh, the good thing with that is typically uh, there's not a large upfront investment or sometimes there's no upfront investment. Um, the solutions should, you know, if, if you're set up the right way, you should immediately see an impact and you should see some efficiencies in ROI immediately. Um, you're also able to oftentimes, um, you're often able to scale up for peak season like we talked about. If there's a, you know, a need for additional resources or robotics, uh, you're able to generally get that from uh, whoever you're sourcing that from. Um, but on the backside, you know, the, the CapEx might give you a little bit more control of your own destiny if you have the infrastructure in place, if you have those experts in place that, um, you know, really know what they're doing, then it might make more sense to, to invest in, um, you know, some some fixed solutions and uh, automated conveyance and things like that, that, uh, you know, might be a, a bigger upfront investment, but down the line, you'll, you'll see that you're saving money without uh, having to pay your month over month due. So it really depends on what, how you're structured and, and what your core competency is as a fulfiller. And basically it's all going to come down to the fact is what does the customer want and uh, making both available to them and going from there. Uh, speaking of customers, why don't we take a, a quick look at an, uh, our unnamed customer, mutual customer, both of ours, that um, we came in, we we're offering something for them. They've been using us for sh shipping software for a while, but how it was a great mix for both of us to help the customer. Can you run through this customer, what they got out of it? And I know we've got some more uh, facts on this after this one. Yeah, so this is a, a large e-commerce um, retailer, and uh, they were having challenges that everyone's having challenges with, with labor. They needed to increase their throughput. Um, they wanted to reduce their shipping costs. Um, they are, were also getting feedback from consumers that they wanted to have more sustainable solutions. Um, so, you know, this is pretty typical with what we see in a lot of uh, e-commerce a lot of challenges that a lot of e-commerce uh, customers of ours are, are seeing. Yeah, and it's when it gets down to some of the particulars, let me jump on to the next one. Um, these were some of the key factors that came into play for this customer. At least on our side, we know what happened. They wanted real-time rate shopping. Um, they wanted to know that they had business rules in place. They wanted to know that their savings could be across the board and they were making everything so decisions were made by the system, not by the employees having to do it, which led to a, a great deal of savings. And the other thing that came up for them, which really came into play during COVID, was carrier compliance and making sure that the rates were up to date. Accessorials, all those surprises went away when the carriers would come out with all these surcharges and everything else. They've got to know what's out there and the things going on. And the, the last thing, optimize you know that visibility for them, knowing what's in the warehouse, what's leaving the warehouse, where it is on the carrier and the things from there. Uh, they also use third-party audit to help with this, to drive some of the things, but it all comes back through that WMS and working with it and going from there. Jack, on your side, Pregis was able to do a number of things. Can you run, from, run through what they did? Yeah, so we implemented our automated bagging solution in the facility. Uh, so right away, going from a, a box to a bag takes a considerable amount of shipping cost out. Uh, your dim weight is uh, significantly reduced. And then, you know, like we talked about the rule of thumb, four to one. So we were able to redeploy a lot of their um, the packers to other areas of the facility. Um, material reduction. So you're printing the shipping information that ProShip is sending down to us directly on that bag. So you're getting rid of labels, you're getting rid of uh, extra um, void and things like that. And then um, on the sustainability side, one thing that we were able to implement that we do a lot of times for our e-commerce customers is print the how to recycle uh, shipping labels on the uh, on the bags themselves. So that's just the, the consumer friendly um, the consumer friendly labeling program that just takes out all the guesswork. The, it gets rid of that one through seven recycling um, number and tells the consumer exactly how to recycle it. In this case, those bags are all store drop off recyclable at grocery stores and places like that that you can find on that website. So that satisfied their sustainability need. And we did an earlier podcast today that talked about sustainability and it's amazing how that one, uh, how the people market them the company to others. So that's that image that they've got 
with the customer is key to success and how they view that um, experience they have with that department store and going from there. What, why don't we move here, um, integrating the solutions with um, the customer. I think there's the same things that actually go on. It doesn't matter if you're a manufacturer, it doesn't matter if you're retail, whatever you're doing, uh, 3PL. Walk me through some of this. Yeah, sure. So it's a very it's a very simple integration. So uh, product comes down a line, a packer scans an order slip, places the product on a scale, and then that uh, that triggers the WMS to send that information to the ProShip software. ProShip optimizes, finds the optimal shipping method, and sends that information back down. Uh, then the shipping label is printed directly on the bag. The bag dispensed. The packer place, places the product in the bag, seals it, and then that bag comes right back off the line, either into a gate order, right back onto a trunk line to go through shipping. So it's it's a really simple integration, but everything's happening, you know, in a matter of seconds, and you're getting that optimal uh, shipping method from ProShip, saving a lot of money there. You're saving a lot of money on the labor. So huge, huge wins for this customer. So not just for yourself, how are you doing this? This crosses the line, not just for your baggers, but pick, pack, and apply machines pretty much across the board? Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, that's kind of generally how it's it's set up is everything's um, activated by scan. Uh, whether that, you know, one thing that we we're talking about too is if your WMS already has product weights built into it, then you could eliminate that that scale from the pack station. If it doesn't, you can have a scale at a pack station or in line to weigh that as it comes and um, yeah all that information then is instantly triggered up to the cloud or into uh, the ProShip software right back down and um, yeah whether it's a bagger or another kind of um, setup with a box and a, and a printer on an invoice printer on a line it's all the same yeah it's so this is interesting the last thing here talking about the company that we did this for or you guys did um, how many machines they put out there was is amazing, um, but allowed them to build an ROI. Can you just quick give a real quick overview on this one? Yeah, so we do a lot of testing and validation in house. So that that solution was tested and validated, and then they ended up um, placing 200 of our bagging solutions across a number of their different distribution centers. Um, so those 200 machines were able to redeploy 600 packers. Um, Immediately, immediately saw savings. They had their ROI in under a year, and then each subsequent year, we're talking about millions of dollars in labor reduction alone. And then, you know, quantify some of the things that ProShip was able to do on the shipping cost side of it. You're looking at uh, really significant savings for this e-commerce shipper. Yeah, that it is impressive, and I wish we could share the name. But um, going from there, let's let's talk about that next level of automation that we're doing here. Again, we're going back to the same thing that we're, we're saying is key to everything happening, the WMS. Walk me through just a couple of these key things like we mentioned before. Yeah, so, you know, actually you brought up a good point with the accessorial charges. So I'll just quickly bring up an anecdote with a customer we were working at. Um, they had, uh, they didn't have their WMS optimized. So when they had large orders, they were selecting their largest box size and they didn't have uh, some of the shipping, uh, in, you know, their carrier information in there that had some of those accessorial fees associated with it. So after doing some, some digging, they saw that they were, uh, be because they were shipping in large oversized boxes that couldn't go on the standard conveyance, they were getting charged additional millions of dollars a year. And if they chopped up that same order into smaller boxes, they could uh, you know, see significant savings immediately. So those are some of the kinds of things that you need to look at and you need to implement into your WMS. Um, but really, you know, just across the board, if you, the more information that you have here, the more efficient you're gonna be because you can route products to the right places, your picking's optimized, it's moving products along to the right, um, the right transportation system. So having your technology here is key. And I mean, there's obviously a number of different types of software solutions that you can implement, but We'll just keep it uh, high level as call it the WMS, but this is kind of your your holy grail when it comes to uh, warehouse efficiency. Yeah, I agree 100%. And then we work on to some of these other capabilities, especially from what ProShip can supply for it. 
and going from their rate trapping capabilities, it's amazing. Everybody will ask, well, do we rate trap? Some people will say, we don't need to, we don't need to have some of the other aspects with it. But rate trapping, it, it, it's kind of a wide application when we talk about rate trapping. It could be contracts against each other or actually capabilities within one contract for a carrier. So there's so many things that you can do with the packaging to be able to rate shop. Um, with that being said, for you guys, the printing onto the bag is just immensely important. Can you run through that? Yeah, it's just it's one of those things that it takes um, one step out of the process. It uh, eliminates the need to add additional material with a, a printing label itself. Um, it's one of those things where you see immediate savings uh, for customers and, and really just it's more about speed and efficiency than anything. And one of the things we really wanted to highlight on this discussion about automation and uh, by the way, favorite little uh, gif here that was put in. Um, we talked about uh, AMRs, you know, the autonomous mobile robot. You guys don't do it, but how, that, how important that is to our software, to your product that you're selling is getting it to the customer, getting it to the pack station. Tell us a little bit about that and how you've seen it in the industry right now. Yeah, so yeah, we, we don't, um, this isn't an area that we uh, play in. We more partner with different companies that are in the AMR space, but this is an example of um, an AMR solution that's going out and it's doing picking uh, and, and picking products for orders. Then it's queuing up to a pack station or specific pack stations if there's multiple pack stations. And then that uh, the person there is scanning each product, which will trigger uh, the WMS to tie that product to the right order if it's a single uh, item order. And then the WMS will send that shipping information right down to the bagger, print it in line, and then the packer can seal it. So um, you know, this is an area that we see is growing tremendously. We're partnered with a number of companies that do AMR. Um, again, it's great because you can scale for specific peak seasons. Um, it's a really good solution if you have a really wide variety of products or a wide product mix. If you have a small product mix, it's probably overkill to implement this kind of solution. You could do something similar that um, doesn't require, you know, a fleet of robotics. But, um, you know, especially if you're looking at um, a, a robotics as a service type of implementation, you don't want to spend a lot of money on a capital expense with conveyance. Um, this might be a, a good solution for you to, to um, to implement. And I, I find it interesting that you've got up to seven pickers um, is what's your qualification that you say for looking at one of these. Um, any other key things that you want to mention for the application which it's best for for this? So uh, it's great for single item orders uh, because that you can scan right away. If you're uh, if you have multi-product orders then you need to make sure that the, the uh, robots are queued up properly or going to a station beforehand to be um, batched into, into totes. Um, but really, you know, you do need to meet certain thresholds to really make this a viable solution. Um, what's nice about this company in particular is they do offer additional solutions like um, uh, some handheld uh, picking automation that a uh, packer could be put, could be in a zone in that space and uh, have some indicators to help them uh, manually pick products. So if you don't meet that 5,000 orders a day, 1,000 SKUs, uh, you might want to just invest in a software solution that kind of helps optimize that picking without the robotics in place. It, yeah, it's, it's amazing what this can do. And I just want to pass on for the next one. Uh, this is probably the fastest growing area that we're seeing the predictions on this. Can you run a little bit about the picking and placing robotics? Yeah, so this is this is a huge growth area. Um, you can see in the next couple of years, it's going to go from 150 to almost three billion dollars uh, in terms of market. Uh, again, we we don't do the robotic arms or the the integration itself, but we partner with a number of companies that do. Um, and this is you know obviously specific to end of line packaging, but these you know these robotic arms can do and they can be implemented in a number of areas across uh, a fulfillment center. Usually, what their really core competency is, is the, the technology, the AI visioning that can determine what a product is, uh, scan that to pull in that order information and then drop it into a bag if it's the end of the line that you're seeing here. But, um, you know, we're talking about that four to one rule. You still have one packer that's, um, you know, generally 
putting product into a bagging machine. This is, you know, taking that and fully automating it. So there's no one at that station and you could theoretically run a lights out type of uh, warehouse fulfillment center when you implement these kinds of solutions. So, um, you know, the things that these are, the areas where these are really good, it's e-commerce, 3PL, nutraceuticals, it, you know, anything that's not a, a soft good, as long as it can uh, be picked up with the, the, um, the robotic arm there, uh, it, can be, it can be scanned and packed. So uh, if soft goods already have a dust cover or something like that on there, then this is a great solution for it. But, um, you know, when you're looking at the thresholds for implementing this kind of solution to make sure it makes sense, uh, great for single item, single item orders. They're getting better at multi item orders, which would be, you know, you need to do some of that batching up front or that sortation up front. But um, at least 12,000 shipments a day. And that's, again, 12,000 shipments a day that are going through this line. So if you have a variety of different packaging mediums like boxes and bags, it would be 12,000 specifically to a bagging machine to make this make sense. And then the more ships you have, the, the better um, the better payout you're going to get because you're you're eliminating the need for, for labor as you go. So, I mean, obviously that makes sense. But this is an area where we see a huge uh, growth opportunity. I think we're going to see uh, more and more of these implemented into uh, fulfillment centers in the next year or two. I've got to agree. I think that's the same feedback we're getting from our clients when they're asking us, uh, where do we tie into this whole process? process uh, sorry, process. As far as shipping software, it's all these multiple factors tying again to the WMS and what it can do and going from there. And we mentioned the Modex show before we started the presentation. Um, we saw so many of these units down there that they were doing demos with it. It's it's amazing to watch it. Um, as you mentioned, also PACX is coming up in October. If you're out there, people, and you're looking for shows to see it, that might be a spot to go. How about for our last part here when we're talking about things and we're going to uh, talk about the really, sorry, one, one pass, uh, future-proofing your warehouse and automation. Walk me through just a few of the things with it. Um, we talked about every one of these, but definitely that build to scale leveraging experts. We didn't cover that much on the experts. Can you just walk through these three again and talk a little bit more about how the experts that can come out and help you, the engineers, the other things with that? Yeah, so I mean, so previous were experts in end of line packaging automation, but there's so many different areas of a fulfillment center that um, you, know, you need to uh, determine before you really set yourself up for success. Um, and a lot of times we're leveraging um, systems integrators. So there's a number of systems integrators that Pregis works with and has relationships with that are, they're doing the full build out of a fulfillment center. They're looking at the technology, what the WMS is. They're looking at the optimal layout. They're um, looking at all of the different components and can oftentimes do a lot of the, uh, the legwork for companies to understand, you know, it does it make more sense to do a capital expense? Does it make more sense to do a robotics as a service? they know you know how can we how can we set this set this place up to scale for growth if you're looking at 10 percent growth each year without having to invest in a, another um fulfillment center as we saw it's becoming more and more costly and hard to even find so though these are the kind of experts that um you know we would point to and we have uh, relationships with when they they'll bring us in specifically to help them with the end of line packaging optimization yeah, and it's, it seems like taking this one slide, there's so much to do within everything that we're talking about. Definitely take advantage of the expert squad and see some of the things that are going on. As I mentioned earlier, if you've got a question, feel free to ask um, and going from there. After we're done with these questions, we are going to go to James and show a quick example of some of the things that you guys do right after this. But we do have one, um, one question here. Uh, coming back to you here, Jack, how are we reusing packaging materials that have been used so that the operating costs can be reduced? So, you know, I guess it depends on what your setup is and, and what exactly um, your packaging material is itself. Um, so, you know, there's there's some machines that can turn boxes into void fill and things like that. But I think ideally, um, when you're looking at packaging, you're um, setting yourself up to use to use opt the optimal setup. So, um, you know, things like if you're using air pillows, making sure that you're right sizing your, your box. So you're using the right uh, amount of 
material. You're not uh, overpacking or adding additional void fill. Um, if you're if you have excess uh, packaging there, you could collect that, grind it up, and send it back to us. We'd love that recycled material so we could incorporate it back into to our packaging. But generally, when we're looking at things, we're we're trying to find uh, a solution that doesn't have excess packaging. Um, you're we're giving the, the the customer exactly what they're looking for and making sure that we're we're providing the right material base and and uh, the right delivery system to make sure that uh, they're they're getting exactly what they're looking for without access. That's a great example. Thanks. Appreciate it. So Q and A. If you've got any questions, here's our contact information. We're gonna bring this back out and send it to you guys in a little bit. But what we wanted to do next here is be able to show you an example of the product that they do. And James, are you there to come back on? Yep. How's it going, everyone? Perfect. I'm going to uh, stop sharing my slides here and we'll be able to get James to get to a full view and going from there. So Jack, uh, I'm going to turn off my camera also so we can have a full screen for, uh, for you there, James, and be able to go through it. James, why don't you show us a great example of what you guys can do and how simple it is? Sure. Yep. So I'll, I'll get up and I'll give you guys a demo. If anyone has a question, you can put it in the chat. Um, and then, um, then we'll go from there. We'll make it interactive. You know, if you, if you guys have a question, just shout it out and, and let me know. So we'll uh, we'll go ahead and switch over. I'm actually in our demo room in uh, Sussex, Wisconsin. We're right outside Milwaukee, and uh, we've got all of our equipment in this room here. We're actually right up the road from ProShip um, over in Brookfield, just a few miles from here, uh, from our headquarters. So we've got all of our equipment in here. This is where we bring a lot of customers in. And they do trials. So again, you know, if you've got applications you're looking at, then you can let us know. Um, and this is kind of the the main machine that we're we're talking about today. This was um, it was just released at the PMI show last year. This is our 24 inch machine, and this is a a bagging unit, right? So we have a box of bags in the back. We have an integrated printer up on top of the machine right here, and this is going to receive the shipping label. And then we're going to print the bag and present it open for the operator. Um, so if you're not familiar with bagging, you know this is um, this is one of the machines that you might be looking at. We've got a few others uh, in our portfolio. I'm going to come back and talk about this one in just a moment. But uh, just for example, um, we do a lot of just straight up automation. This is a bowl feeder next to our bagger, so we can put ten screws or nuts or bolts or whatever in the machine. Um, so we do a lot of just straight up automation that have no operators. They're designed to be lights out from the start. And then we also have a hand load machine right here. So we do a lot of e-commerce with this one as well. Um, this would be for like single item orders. So what we're doing is we're we're printing a bag and we've got it presented open to the operator. They just place the product inside the bag here and then they hit the buttons. And then we seal the bag and drop it out. Now this bag happens to be clear, but we do this with um, opaque mailers as well. We're going to print the shipping label directly onto the bag. So we'll jump back over here to our large machine. And I'll show you what that process would look like over here. Uh, so again, this machine can do up to 24 inch wide bag. We've also got solutions that do, um, you know, that are slightly smaller for different applications. So what the operator is going to be doing, you know, they're going to take their product that they've got, they'll set it on a scale. And they'll hit a button, which is going to go make a request to Pro Ship. They're going to send us a shipping label. We get that bag opened, and all the operator has to do is place it in there and hit the button, and then that sealed bag is, is sent out and ready to go. So here we've got again that shipping label printed directly on the poly bag. We put a seal across the top that's going to keep that product contained in there, and then we've got conveyance options as well. So this machine has a conveyor underneath. And so we can run product um, directly out to a shipping sorter from here, right? So this conveyor, and we can get them to go out in different directions to fit different uh, factory warehouses. All right, so again, uh, with labor reduction and all that, we, we know that a lot of our machines are run by, um, run by temps. And so we just try to make it as simple as possible. You bring someone in, you show them the machine. It's really easy to pull the bags through. It's really easy to put printer ribbon in. And then all that you say is, yep, put that on the scale, push the button, 
When Crochet gets you the label, the bag will open, and you just send it out like this, and you're done. So we just try to make it as, as simple and streamlined as possible. Um, we talked about that four to one labor reduction, and there was kind of a question or a comment about, well, what, it, you know, what do you do when you replace that labor? The other three people, a lot of times, as I think a lot of people on here know, you don't actually have four people to start with. You got three or you got two, right? So you're not necessarily um, displacing them. It's really, you're, you're able to do more with less. So you saw in, in these videos, these are real examples that we showed of them actually getting four to one or five to one because you simplify the operation. All that you need to do is just get the label, print it on the bag, and the operator pushes one button and they send the, they send this, uh, the sealed bag out. So you make it as, as easy as possible. You're limiting what the operator has to do and think about. Um, you know, if you, a lot of times what we've seen is if you give them a choice between a small box and a large box, maybe they just always grab the large box because they know it'll fit in there. Because the, the packer, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't hurt them if it costs, you know, 10 more dollars to ship that box out, right? So this machine, we can run different bag sizes on it. Um, through different warehouse systems, you can route single item orders or multi-item orders to different machines in the packing area. And again, all they have to do is just get that label um, and then put the product in there and send it out. Hey, James, quick question for you. It seems like it's a simple method. What are you seeing um, out there, you and Jack, training time to get these, to get a temp able to do it? Yeah, so really quick, um, and I was I was actually on an install yesterday uh, with uh, an eight eight machine setup um, in Toronto, actually up in Canada, and so uh, I've I've trained plenty of operators, and I can tell you like you know this machine with the technology on here, uh, it's really straightforward. When someone when it's their first day, you know the temp agency said just show up, you just teach them the basics, and they can be up and running and. A couple of minutes because it, it really is you know they they get their login on their kiosk they put the product on the scale and they send it out to pro ship and then as far as the machine goes you just put it in there and push a button so it's really not not too much that you have to uh, learn or get up to speed on and that was you know it's inherent in our design it's part of what you know my role is with the application engineering department making sure that our system's easy to use because again i've had to train people i i know I know the difficulties. You teach them how to thread a machine that's complicated, how to pull all the, the bag through, and you don't want that. You just want it to be simple and just to work. So, and then again on the IT side, right, with ProShip, all that we are in the simplest form, we're a network printer, right? So, it, you know, if it's a scary thing to bring in, you know, if you call this automation, right, sometimes people are scared of automation because they think it's going to be complicated and, you know, hard to roll out. Well, You've got a desktop printer that's doing a sticky label today. Just send the label here instead. You're ready, right? We, we can be up and running. All, you, all we need is the IP address, and if you can send us a label, then we'll be, we'll be ready to run. So it, uh, it helps streamline that. James, hey, thanks for showing us today that uh, it's made pretty simple on what we're talking about today. I really appreciate you showing us, Jack. I'm gonna just come back and uh, Come back into sharing this turn on the camera here quick and uh i want to thank you guys for uh hosting with us today to talk a little bit more about the products um we're going to send everybody information on the slides and how you can get a hold of Pregis, how you can get a hold of ProShip. and like we said it's all part of that wms system that we can integrate with and make it simple for the operators make it simple for how you can do the rate shopping how you're doing everything out there in the market the automation's not just our few companies here, there's so many involved in the process, but keep investigating. One of the other things we'll send after this are maybe some websites that you might recommend, Jack, for checking out and talking more about automation that are favorites, and we'll send that out to everybody. But I appreciate it. Jack, any last words, James? No, thanks for joining, and uh, feel free to reach out if you have any questions uh, that we can help you with. Good, thanks for coming along. Yep, thanks guys, I really appreciate it. I'm glad we could do this presentation today for everybody. Thanks to everybody, have a great week, take care, bye-bye.